There we are. All righty, lads and ladies, welcome back. Today, <clears throat> excuse me. Today, I'd like to do a few things. Um, I'd like to work maybe a, a couple more problems having to do with inverse functions, make sure that we're nice and comfortable with those. But the main thing for today is going to be introducing this new family of functions promised last time, um, specifically exponential functions. So one of the reasons <clears throat> that we've um, spend this time developing our understanding of inverse functions is because the next step in this course is to study what are called exponential functions. And those are very, very nice. They're kind of every mathematician, and every engineer, every scientist's favorite functions because all of these big operations and calculus that we, we want to do to functions um, are easiest to do to these uh, exponential functions. They, they behave the nicest under those operations. The inverse to those functions which are also hugely important in math, science, physics, engineering, um, are called logarithms. And they're also very nice, but they're a little harder to work with because there's no clean, convenient way to define them in terms of the algebra operations that we're familiar with. So as we work through exponential functions, I want us to be mindful of um, what the inverse to those functions could look like, could behave like, um, and, uh, and that will help us as we deal with the logarithm functions. So to that end, I think a little bit more practice with exponentials is, or sorry, with uh, inverses is in order. And then I will go ahead and define <clears throat> exponential functions. Now, I know this week, uh, depending on what you did or didn't do over spring break, um, you may be in different places in the homework because we had the homework from the week before spring break that I ended up extending to today. Uh, so I would like to just get a feel. Could you give me any sort of reaction in Zoom? It could be a thumbs up or whatever. Um, if you need more time on the inverse functions homework, which was originally set to be due today. OK, so the majority of us got through it. That's great. All right. then. Um, then I'll just work one quick problem here from the inverse functions set to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. And uh, it doesn't seem like I need to extend that set. Now, if you, if you do need more time, of course, the rule is the same as always. Just go ahead and send me a Canvas message and I'll, I'll be happy to extend that for you. Um, but let's do it. Was there any particular problem in here that you guys found especially challenging? Number 14, this one's a little tricky, and we went ahead and did that in class last time. Oh, I see we got something in the chat. Number 19, sure. Ah, OK. Yeah, these word problems are always a little tricky. Um, one of the reasons, so you remember when I gave you that step, that four step procedure for finding the inverse of a function, one of the big reasons why I say you should wait till the end to switch the variables is because of problems like these, where uh, if you swap the variables right away, it can be a little bit unclear what each variable represents. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> they say n equals f of t represents the population of bats in a subterranean cave <clears throat> at year t, where t equals zero is the year 2000. They want us to find a formula for the inverse function, f inverse of n. Um, and then they want us to interpret that function in the context of the real world problem. Let's take a stab at it. Just got a QCAM talking here. All right. So uh, I guess real first, let's do the title card. This is MAC 1105, section 15, which is. Algebra. And the date today is the 17th of March, 2022. Uh, today, a little more practice with inverses. Um, and then we're going to introduce exponential functions. Okay. So the example we're going to work here, this is number 19 from the homework set 14, it says that n equals f of t is, what was it, 
6,000 plus 400T. That's the number of bats. In some cave. T years after the year 2000. All right, so uh, this is just another way of saying in slightly fewer words what they said that t equals zero corresponds to the year 2000, t equals one will correspond to 2001 and so on. They want us to find and interpret inverse function and call it f inverse of n. Okay. So there's a slightly simpler problem in the homework set before this, where you're given the circumference as a function of the radius, and you're asked to find the radius as a function of the circumference. The notation that was being used there is the same notation that's being used here. If you find the the variable label is a little bit confusing. Maybe look back at that one. Who can remind me if I'm trying to find the inverse function, right? Just think of, think of this guy as your function. If I'm trying to find the inverse of this function, what are the first few steps? What is the first step? Is that equal or change the f of x to y? Yeah. Now here, the variables we're using are different. The independent variable, the input for the original is t. So I'll be setting f of t, this thing. Normally we'd set it equal to y, but they've told us that the symbol they're using here is n. So the kind of analogous first step for this problem, if we're being careful with our notation, is to write n equals 6,000 plus 400t. Basically, you can think of t as x and n as y. <clears throat> and then my second step, what was that? Swap the T and the N out, like flip them. Um, so there's something I like to do before that. And I think so, and this is, this is where, so uh, let me come back here for a minute and make faces at you. I know that in high school classes and in a lot of earlier algebra classes, I see it taught this way where you're supposed to swap the variables and then solve. But if you do that, you're gonna run into a little bit of trouble with the notation they're using here. And this is why I recommend doing something else first. So if you look back at the notes from Monday, you'll, or sorry, from Wednesday, uh, wait, no, you guys are Tuesday, Thursday, sorry. If you look back at the notes from Tuesday, you'll see that the second step there, I have something else. Swapping the variables comes a little later. In the second step, we want to go ahead and solve for the input in terms of the output. So before we swap, we're going to solve for t. So I can subtract the 6,000. And then I can divide through by 400. So normally our first step is to replace f of x by y. And then normally our second step is to solve for x in terms of y. Here we replaced f of t by n, and then we solve for t in terms of n. Same thing, just different labels. <clears throat> they want us to write f inverse of n, which should be a formula for the original output in terms of the original input. And you see here, when I solve for t, I get a formula involving n. So we, there's no need to swap here. This is the thing. Um, in this case, we're not going to swap because we want to use the original variables. Remember, n here represents the number of bats. and t represents years since 2000. So the original function takes in years and spits out numbers of bats. 
the inverse function should be taking in numbers of bats and spitting out years, right? Sending all those original outputs back to their inputs. So we can jump down to our last step, which is where we would just write F inverse for this. And because we're not swapping the variables, the variable here will remain N and we have F inverse of N. So N minus 6,000 over 400, that is F inverse of N. So the, the procedures are nice. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind the little intuitive explanation we wrote above those procedures on Tuesday, which says that the inverse function is what you get when you solve for the output in terms of the original input. So here we've solved for the, uh, we've got the original input here, and it is a function of the original output. So that is our inverse function. And because they wanted us to leave the variable as n, they said they wanted f inverse of n, we're not going to switch the variables. That's the idea. So this would be our inverse function. And if you think about what I wrote down here in step three, we can help ourselves with the interpretation. So this is our answer to part one, or part a, I should say. And then what's the interpretation? F inverse of n represents what? What does this take as inputs? And what does it spit out as outputs? I'll remember n represents the number of bats, right? So this is a function that takes in the number of bats. And the output here would be the original input, which is time, t in years. So this represents <clears throat> the number of years it takes for the bat population to reach capital N. So if you plugged in, say, 20,000 for N, the number that this spits out would be the number of years it's going to take for the bat population to reach 20,000. This business with switching or not switching the variables can be a little bit confusing. Uh, in college algebra classes of yesteryear, um, we would originally teach finding inverse functions where you didn't swap the variables at all. You would write f inverse of y rather than f inverse of x. The only reason to swap the variables is if you want to graph the two functions, the original and the inverse, on the same coordinate axes and see that symmetry that we talked about last time. And that is a valuable bit of insight. But if you're trying to think about an application problem like this, a real world problem, then it's often nicest to leave the inverse function um, with the variables you would get by solving for the input, because that's what the inverse function does. It sends the <clears throat> outputs back to the inputs from which they came. So let me try to sketch this for you. Over here, your domain is t variable. Uh, T's, time, 
for years. And over here, you've got N, which is number of bats. The original function takes in these Ts and spits out these Ns. Right, and we wrote it as F of T. So we write F of T because it's taking in the inputs T and it's spitting out these Ns. The inverse function is going to take in these Ns, the number of bats, and spit out Ts. So you notice when I was drawing these mapping diagrams before I just wrote F and F inverse, I wasn't writing the of or the of here. And there's a good reason for that <clears throat> because it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, but if you leave the variables alone, if you don't swap the variables, then it actually makes great sense. This function, the inverse function, his domain is over here. So his inputs are capital Ns. And he sends each capital N, each number of bats, back home to the time t it took for the population to reach that size. In other words, the variable swapping step in finding inverse functions is a, a useful thing if you're trying to think about the graph. But if you're not thinking about the graph, specifically if you're looking at an application problem where each variable represents some specific quantity, like has some units, um, then it can be a lot more insightful to not swap the variables. OK. So um, I should ask any questions on these steps or this interpretation? Okay, then we're going to begin introducing exponential functions. So that example from the other day where I, I drew a graph of an inverse function, and I said, you know, this is a function that we're not, not familiar with yet, but we can sketch it and its inverse just using those equivalent rules that I said, right? Like a comma b is on the graph of the original, a bunch of equivalencies means b comma a is on the graph of the inverse. The function I was graphing there was a special kind of function called an exponential function. As with the other sort of families of functions we've studied, the only place we can really begin is with a definition. We can sort of explore what these do. So, an exponential function is one of the form f of x equals <clears throat> some constant times some other constant. Let me say b to the x, some books use a to the x, and I'm trying to be consistent with you guys. So I think I haven't introduced this notation, which is nice. Okay. C times b to the x. C is any constant. We don't usually let c be equal to zero because that's kind of boring. It just makes the whole thing zero. But c can be any constant. And b is a b is a positive constant. Okay. 
the requirement that b is a positive number is just because if, if you use a negative number here for this constant, then plugging in different values of x, you can get into trouble, right? Like if you try to plug in one half and b is negative one, then you're going to get the square root of negative one. We want these functions to be well behaved, so we generally require that this number b is a positive constant. Uh, before we dig too much deeper into these, I just want to show you an example. And it's kind of a, a cutesy real world example. Did you guys have to read Of Mice and Men in high school? It's a book by John Steinbeck. It used to be one of those books that you're forced to read in high school. Um, <clears throat> but let's imagine that Lenny and George. By a farm. On day zero, Lenny has one rabbit. All right, so Lenny and George are these characters from Of Mice and Men, and Lenny always wanted to care for rabbits. And if you've read the book Of Mice and Men, you may recall that at Len Lenny at one time does um, obtain a rabbit. Now, the book goes quite sideways and um, doesn't end up well for them, but we can imagine a different ending to Of Mice and Men, where Lenny and George successfully buy their farm, and Lenny gets to bring his rabbit in. So on day zero, Lenny has one rabbit. On day one, George finds another rabbit, and gives it to Lenny. But he warns that rabbits being rabbits, that the number of rabbits will double every day after that. So certainly this isn't 100% realistic. Rabbits like to make more rabbits, but they certainly don't double every day. But let's just pretend they do. I want to find a function. We can call it r of t, which gives the number of rabbits on day t. And we're going to graph this function as well. So while this is a slightly silly example, stuff like this does exist in the real world. Um, definitely, there are plenty of bacteria that double in number every day, or even more often than that. <clears throat> what I'd like to do to find this function is to make a table because we don't have a lot of information. I don't have anything here that's going to tell me how to write down a formula. Um, but if we make a table, we can start looking for patterns. And then maybe if we find a nice pattern, we can get a formula for the function. So let's start with <clears throat> days 0 and 1, because we have the information about that. On day zero, the day these guys get the farm, Lenny has one rabbit. So r of zero is one. On the first day they're living on the farm, Lenny has his rabbit from yesterday, and George finds another one and gives it to Lenny. So Lenny's got two rabbits on day one. And George tells Lenny, every day after this, the number of rabbits is going to double. So how many rabbits are there on day two? Four. Yeah, good, right? Every day they double. Yesterday there were two, so today there's four. On day three? Eight. Eight, very good. 
because every day the number of rabbits doubles. So those four rabbits are going to turn into eight. Let's do one more and then see if we can find the pattern. On day four, how many rabbits would we have? 16. 16, right. So a few fun observations. George and Lenny are very quickly going to drown in a sea of rabbit poop. Um, this farm will quickly be overrun by rabbits. But this being a math class, instead of worrying about the rabbit poop, what I'm worried about are these numbers. Do you recognize anything special about these numbers? All observations are welcome. They're all even. Very good, they're all even. Multiplied even. by two. Good, to go from one to the next, we're multiplying by two. I wanna hang on to the even thing for a minute. Um, these are, so you notice that six doesn't show up here, right? But six is an even number. 10 doesn't show up here, 12 doesn't show up here, but those are even numbers, 14 doesn't show up here. So it's not just that these are even, they're powers of two. And that's coming precisely from Tyson's observation that every time we go up one here, we're multiplying by two, we're doubling. So not only are these even numbers, these are numbers that are only divisible by two. In other words, we can write each one of these as a power of two. So one might seem silly, but that's two to the zero. Two is two to the one. Four, well, that's two squared. Eight is two times two times two. That's two cubed. And 16 is two times two times two times two. It's two to the four. So I want to draw your attention <clears throat> to the pattern here. Each one of these outputs is two raised to some number. And that number is the t value, right? So r of zero is two to the zero. r of one is two to the one. r of two is two to the two. What would r of five be? Let me, let me write what we were just saying. R of zero is two to the zero. R of one is two to the one. This is just writing down the same information from that table. 32. Sorry, I had to use the calculator. No, that's okay. Um, 32 is correct. But what I'd like to do is think of this in terms of the powers of two. So 32, the way we get that is by calculating two to the five, right? So in general, it looks here like R of T on any day T is going to be two to the T. And this is our first exponential function. The variables are different here. I'm not using x as the input. But do you see how this guy, 2 to the t, fits into this form? This is 1 times 2 raised to the variable. 1 times 2 raised to the variable. This is an exponential function. to the t. In other words, here c is 1 and b is 2. This is an exponential. Exponential function.
C is sometimes called the initial value. Because exponential functions show up so often in these real world application problems, the constants C and B have um, a real world interpretation. So C is the initial value. It's the amount of stuff you start with. Right? If your exponential function is measuring an amount of stuff, like rabbits, then C is the number of rabbits you start with. And B has a name too, it's called the base. The initial value is, like I said, the amount you start with. And the base, this is the amount you multiply by when the variable uh, increases by one. So like in our rabbit example, the base came out to be two precisely because the number of rabbits doubles or gets multiplied by two every day, every time t goes up by one. This was our final answer for that example. Uh, what I'd like to do is look at the more kind of abstract general function f of x equals two to the x, um, where we're not thinking about rabbits or days, and see if we can sketch the graph of that. And from there, we'll start looking at some other exponential functions. Are there any questions about how we came up with this formula? wasn't really a strict algebra procedure, was it? We just kind of looked for a pattern in here. I will be giving you some formulas, some things that we can kind of apply more generally. Um, but first, let's take a look at some graphs. So let's, let's sketch the graph of f of x equals two to the x. Find the domain and range. Any intercepts and any asymptotes. And we can use our graphing calculators to help us here. Go ahead and take a second while this emulator is loading up. Grab out your graphing calculator, get it powered up. There we go. I'm going to hit the Y equals button here. And I want to graph the function f of x equals 2 to the x. So I'm just going to type the Y1, 2 raised to the power of x. And then I'll hit graph. And we get this shape. It's not super clear what's going on over here. So we're going to make a table to help us out a little bit. But we can start by sketching the graph just as we see it there. Now let me go ahead and pull up the table. We'll hit second in graph to get our table. And I'll mark some y values here. So 
So we see that zero comma one is on the graph. One comma two is on the graph. Two comma four is on the graph. Three comma eight is on the graph. It's the same graph that we were working with on Tuesday. If we scroll back, what do we see? Negative one comma 0.5. Negative two comma 0.25. Negative three comma 0 0.125, which is one eighth. So what this graph looks like is this. Every time you take a single step to the right, the height doubles. So the next point on this graph over here would be two comma, or sorry, would be four comma 16, way up here. All right, and it just keeps going up and up and up like this very, very fast. Every time we go up by one on the x-axis, we're doubling the height. And the opposite is true as you walk to the left. Every time you go to the left one unit, the height gets cut in half. What that means is that as we walk over this way, the height's getting cut in half every time I go to the left by one. So we're going to get very, very small as we go off to the left. One of the things I see a lot when people draw these graphs is they end up drawing an x-intercept somewhere over here. It looks like there's an x-intercept, doesn't it? But think about it the way we just said. Every time we go to the left, we cut the height in half. So let's assume we're starting here at one. When I go to the left one unit, I'm going to go down by half. I'm going to chop that height in half, and now I'm at one half. I go left one unit, I go down by half, so now I'm at one fourth. I go left one, go down by half, so I'm at one eighth. If I start at one, and I keep chopping that in half, in half, in half, in half, in half, will I ever get to zero? No. Good. Yeah, if you've ever heard of Zeno's paradox, this is the heart of Zeno's paradox. Zeno was an, an old Greek philosopher who said that you can never close the gap between you and somebody else because you first have to cover half the distance, then you have to cover half of that distance, then you have to cover half of that distance. Since dividing by two, no matter how many times you do it, will never get you to zero, Zeno said it's impossible to close the gap. It's impossible to walk all the way up to somebody else. Um, <clears throat> Zeno was a little bit silly. Of course, I can walk up to you. But the idea here is that there will never be an x-intercept over here because we're only ever chopping this height in half. And no matter how small that height is, when you cut it in half, you're not going to get zero. So that means we have a horizontal asymptote over here. We're going to get closer and closer and closer to the x-axis where y is equal to zero, but we're never going to touch it. I can label these points because, of course, they're hard to see. This is negative 3, comma, 1, 8. This guy is negative 2, comma, 1, 4. This is negative 1, comma, 1, half. The y-intercept here is 0, comma, 1. This point is 1, comma, 2, 2, comma, 4. 3, 8, and the guy that would be way up here, that would be 4, 16. That's a bad graph. Two to the X. All exponential functions have a graph that looks like this, roughly this shape. And sometimes they're flipped over uh, horizontally so that they're going like this. We'll look at some examples like that, but they all have this same sort of shape. We want to define the domain and the range. And although we've said it, we haven't written down the result for the intercepts. Let's do that. 
So the y-intercept we can see right here is the point 0, 1. And I said it, but we didn't write it. There are no x-intercepts. Because no matter what number you plug in for x, 2 to the x will never be equal to 0. No matter how many times you chop something in half, you'll never get all the way down to 0. So this arrow goes further and further to the left. This goes off forever and ever and ever, getting as close as you possibly can to this horizontal asymptote, but never touching it. This arrow goes up and up and up. Every time you go to the right, that height doubles. What is my domain? In negative infinity, comma, infinity. Very good, right? We go, this arrow goes all the way to the left. This arrow goes up, but as it goes up, it also goes to the right. So the domain here is all real numbers negative infinity to infinity. And if I swoosh the whole graph down onto the x-axis, everybody gets hit. There is a point on the graph over there whose x value is this. It's just way up off the top of the page. What about the range? If I swoosh this graph down onto the y-axis, what gets hit? One comma infinity. So if I take, if I ignore this side and I just smoosh this onto the y axis, that will hit from one up to infinity. But what about this side? Let's, let's cover this up for a minute. If I smoosh this portion of the graph over, what does that end up hitting? Everything but zero? Um, well, almost. So do I hit any negative numbers? No. So everything except for zero and the negative numbers. In other words, all the positive numbers, right? So this portion of the graph over here is going to get smooshed onto the y interval from zero to one. And this portion of the graph up here is going to get smooshed onto everything one and larger. So that's everything from zero up to infinity. When we talk about graphs of exponential functions, these are the basic things we want to make sure we can find. Asymptotes, intercepts, domain and range. If you know those things and you have a few points on your graph, then you should be able to have a, a full picture of the function. I'm going to show you how the numbers in the formula correspond to the, the shape of the graph. Um, before that, I want to make sure we're all really comfortable with these things. Are there any questions at all about how we're finding the domain, the range, the asymptote, the intercepts? Let's play the same game, but let's do it with a slightly different function.
let's take the function f of x equals one half to the x and find the uh, sketch it, and then find the domain, the range, intercepts, and asymptotes. Again, I'll use our graphing calculator to help us out here. I'm going to type parentheses, one half, so one divided by two, close parentheses, raised to the power of x. So when I hit graph here, I'm going to see a picture very similar to the one we just saw. Maybe I'll change my window settings, right? Since the range here appears to be the same as the last one, just positive numbers, I don't need those negative y values. So let's set our y min to just negative one. That'll let us see what's going on here a little better. There we go. So it's very similar to the last one, except it's flipped over horizontally. It's flipped over the y-axis. I can use my table to help us out. So from the table, we see that negative three comma eight is on this graph. Negative two comma four is on this graph. Negative one comma two is on this graph. Zero comma one. And then as we scroll to the right, I'm scrolling down on the table, one comma zero point five, or one comma one half is on this graph. 2 comma 1 4, 3 comma 1 8. It's the exact same thing, it's just been flipped over. Again, we have this asymptote, this horizontal asymptote. Zero. Remember what we said the base B represents. It's the number that you multiply the output by every time the variable X goes up by one. So every time X goes up by one here, every time we go to the right, we're multiplying by one half instead of multiplying by two. So instead of doubling your height as you go to the right, you're chopping your height in half. And instead of having your height as you go to the left, you're multiplying by two. Remember when we talked about increasing and decreasing functions. The function we drew over here is always increasing. As you go from right to left, you're always going uphill. The function we drew here is always decreasing. As you go right to left, you're always going downhill. This is called a decaying exponential. And the last one is called a growing exponential. Wait a few points here. The domain is the same. The graph continues forever and ever in both directions to the left and the right. So the domain is all real numbers on negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is the same. If I swoosh this graph down onto the y-axis, this part hits everything bigger than one. This part hits everything between zero and one. So the range is again zero to infinity. And then intercepts, the y-intercept here is the same, 0, 1. And again, there's no x 
intersect. These two provide examples of the two sort of standard shapes for an exponential. Growing exponential and the decaying exponential. Growing exponentials look like these. And decaying exponentials look like the one we just drew. One of the things you want to be able to do is tell when somebody hands you a formula for an exponential function, whether it is growing or decaying. This, both of these can be written as some constant C times some other constant raised to the power of X. In a growing exponential, B is bigger than one. In a decaying exponential, B is smaller than one. Always bigger than zero, but smaller than one. So if I give you an exponential where the base is like 0.75 or one half or two thirds, those will be decaying exponentials. And if I give you an exponential function where the base is bigger than one, something like two or three or five, then those will be growing exponentials. You can always use your graphing calculator to make a table and find a few points on the graph, but you need to know the basic graph shape and you want to be able to anticipate these just by looking at the formula. Let's find something fun in here. Introduce the natural exponential. Oh no, there it is. Yep. Right. Okay, yeah, that is something we should talk about. Okay. Some facts about exponentials. They never have x intercepts. They always, always have horizontal asymptote y equals zero. The domain will always be negative infinity to infinity, and the range will always be zero to infinity. Just like the two we've looked at so far, this is true for all of these. They're also always monotone, meaning always increasing. That's it. 
C is bigger than one, i.e. growing exponential, or always decreasing. If you're looking at a decaying exponential where B is between zero and one. One of the things that we like to emphasize is that this growth for exponential functions, their rate of change is very large. Growing exponentials grow much faster than any polynomial or linear function or power function. So it may not look it, but if you're looking over here, it might not look like it's growing very fast, might not be very steep. But as you come further and further and further to the right, this slopes get more and more and more and more vertical. So much so that this will outpace, this will be more vertical, will grow faster than any power function or any polynomial. Comparing exponentials to linear functions is one of the things that your homework asks you to do. They want you to be able to tell from a table whether you're looking at an exponential or a linear function. So if you want to compare and contrast exponential growth, what's going on with exponential growth is you multiply by some constant every time x goes up by one. Like in that first example with the rabbits, we multiply the output by two every time x goes up by one, we double. Linear growth follows a similar pattern, but instead of multiplying by some constant every time x goes up by one, you add, right? That's the slope, you add some constant every time x goes up by one. So if I give you two tables and I ask you to classify the growth there as exponential or linear, you would want to see if you are adding a constant every time x goes up by one or multiplying by a constant every time x goes up by one. Let's do a quick example. Tables here. Okay. 
<laughs> zero two, no, sorry, zero one two three. Sorry. So in the in the first table, let me fix these inputs. Right, it's zero one two and three, not zero two three and four. In the first table, am I looking at linear growth or exponential growth, and why? Linear. Good. This is you're adding two. Right. Every time x goes up by one, we're adding two to the output. So this would be linear. with slope two. What about the second table, the table for g of x? Is it exponential because the power is three? Yeah, that's the idea. So it's exponential. I wouldn't say that the power is three. So the big idea with exponential functions is that the variable is the power. That's the strange thing, that the power is the variable. So it's true that every time we go up by one here, we're multiplying by three, right? Two times three is six. And if I increase x by one again, six times three is 18. If I will increase x again, 18 times three is 54. So this is exponential. With, and the term for this, just like with linear functions, the term for the number that you add each time is the slope. The term for the number you multiply by each time in exponentials is the growth factor. So here the growth factor is three. That's another name for the base, right? Here, the name we use for, for slope over here is called the growth factor. So this constant when we're talking about exponentials is called the growth factor. And this constant over here when we're talking about linear functions you're familiar with is called the slope. The growth factor is just the base of the exponential function. Okay. Questions on how you can recognize exponential growth versus linear growth or what these terms mean? Let's take a look at one more problem here, something fun. So I want you to think about which one of these are undefined. I don't want to spoil this for you. Think about your rules for exponents. But evaluating functions, that's not too exciting. Something a little more fun. Oh, yeah, the number e. We need to talk about that. So around the time of the American Revolution, there was this mathematician named Euler, Leonard Euler. He was like a Swiss German mathematician. Um, and he did so many beautiful things in mathematics. One of the things he's famous for is studying compound interest. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Compound interest is the system that most modern banks use to figure out interest in a bank account. What they're doing is they're taking the regular simple interest formula that you're familiar with, that the interest is equal to PRT, principal times rate times time. 
And they apply that over and over and over again. So they check and see how much interest you've earned from you know, today to tomorrow, from tomorrow to the next day, next day to the next day. And they add that amount to the account. And then they use that number moving forwards. So the, the formula that we usually see here is that the amount in the account, T units of time after making the deposit is the principal times one plus the interest rate over the number of compoundings raised to the number of compoundings times the time. Don't worry too much about this, right? This isn't something that you're going to have to work with right now. But Euler, that was the man's name, studied this function as n got bigger and bigger. So N in that formula is the number of times the bank checks in per year to calculate the interest, right? If T is measured in years, then N is the number of times the bank collects or uh, compounds, the word is compounds the interest, calculates how much interest you've earned so far, adds that into the bank account. What he found is that or really big values of n, the expression you get here, if you ignore all the other variables, make all the other variables equal to one, gets closer and closer to some constant. It's approximately 2.71828, blah, blah, blah. You can try this, take your calculator and plug like some big ass number in for N there. You can plug in your phone number if you want. That's a, a common cute trick. What I'll do is make a little table here. We'll do one plus one over X, close parentheses, raised to the X. And I'll hit second and graph to bring up a table. Now, this thing is undefined when n is zero, of course. But if we scroll way down, what you see is that the numbers on the right-hand side are getting closer and closer and closer to some particular number. And if I change my table settings, delta table, start at 50 and increase by 50. So we can scroll down really quickly. You'll see these numbers getting closer and closer to the number I wrote down here, 2.71828. It's gotta go quite a while till we get that third digit. There it is, 2.718. And then eventually you'll see a two. We call this number E. And E is this 2.71828, blah, blah, blah. It turns out that a lot of things in the natural world work very similar to compound interest. Like if you're studying population growth, the number of objects or things there will be, people, whatever, uh, one year later depends on a few things. It depends on how many people there are right now and how fast the population is growing and how often they reproduce. Those would be like the initial population, how fast the population wants to grow and how often they reproduce. This number is called Euler's number. But because it shows up in real world problems so much, we also call it the natural base. It is an irrational number, like pi or the square root of two. And for us, it forms uh, a nice exponential function. So the exponential function
f of x equals this number to the x is called the natural exponential. Its graph looks the same as all the other growing exponentials, but the numbers on it are quite weird. The outputs are, are kind of well, because E is a weird number, it's this nasty irrational number. E to the X has nasty outputs. Still has that same basic shape. Still has that same Y intercept of zero comma one. But then here you have the point one comma E. Here you would have the point two comma e squared. And up here you would have the point three comma e cubed. To get a feel for what these numbers are like, we're going to use our calculator. You have a button on your calculator for E. If you look above the divide button in blue there, there's the symbol E. And if I just type, just type that and hit enter, it'll tell me it's about 2.71828, blah, blah, blah. If I ask it, how big is E squared? I type E, then square, then hit enter. You see that that is about, this is an E, so E squared is about 7.3, call it 7.39. E cubed is about 20.09-ish. 20 20 and E itself, we said earlier, is about 2.0. Seven, two. So you see how big this is getting, right? Every time we go up by one, we're multiplying by E. So this is at like height 2.7. This is at height like 7.4. This is at height like 20.1, right? Getting, getting quite tall, quite fast. What I want you to do is you're working through your homework this week. None of the problems here involve like crazy equation solving. What they do involve is getting a feel for these functions. So especially in this first half, I want you to take your time as you plug into these functions, evaluate them, but also maybe consider looking at the graphs, right? Go ahead and plot some of these in your graphing calculator or on Desmos as you work and see if you can get a feel for how fast they grow, what the graphs look like, where the intercepts and asymptotes are. And then next time we're going to talk a lot about these application problems. So I'm going to give you some special formulas that will help you um, resolve, not these questions, these ones you can all solve right now, but the next homework set is going to have a lot of application questions that require some careful work. There's one thing here that, that I want to make sure I, I give you before we go because this is a, it's very much just a play with the intuitive homework set. But if you look down at question number 22, they do actually have one of these compound interest things. So make sure before we go that you have this compound interest formula in your notes. And I'm gonna give you the values of these parameters. I'm gonna tell you what each of these variables represents. And next time we will play more with this and also some other special formulas for exponential functions. P here is called the principal. It's the original amount invested. So you invest or borrow. R is the interest rate. N is the number of compoundings
And usually we say per year, but if we're careful, it's per unit time. So let me say, annually. yeah, we'll say per year. Okay, and T of course is time. In this case, for your homework set, it'll be measured in years. So you've got one problem where you're gonna have to use this and we'll look at this a little bit more carefully next time along with um, some special formulas for exponential functions that will allow us to solve some cool problems like half-life, radioactive decay or doubling time, how fast populations grow, that sort of thing. Um, but between now and Tuesday, I want you guys to just uh, finish up the inverse function homework if you have not yet, and then work through this exponential homework set. There's nothing too crazy here. It's all stuff that you've seen before. Um, we're just trying to get a feel for these functions. So the only bit of extra advice I would give you is that as you solve these problems, maybe pull open the Desmos window or pull out your calculator and graph them. Try to get a, a familiarity with what these look like. Exponential functions are a totally new family of functions. The variable is in the power. We've never seen that before. We've seen things like x squared, x cubed, x to the one half, where you've got some variable raised to a constant power. But we've never seen a function where you have a constant raised to a variable power. So it's going to take some getting used to. Tuesday, we'll continue with exponential functions. We're also going to do a little activity involving exponential functions. So make sure you come to class on Tuesday um, and make sure you hang around the whole time so we can get to the activity. Um, that is it. I'll have your partial credit in. I'm aiming to have it all in by Tuesday of next week. So uh, if you haven't gotten yours yet, just hang in there. And if you need anything from me, you know where to find me, right? I've got office hours today from 11 to 12. And uh, you can also reach out to me through Canvas or email. That's it from me, guys. Take care.